we're rounding up some interesting plants and coming up with some effective garden problem solutions. It all starts right after this. I'm Alan Smith, welcome to the show. You know, I just love spring. For a gardener, well, it doesn't get much better than that. So many things coming up and the garden centers, well, they're packed with beautiful plants, like this gorgeous begonia I just bought. Not sure where I'm gonna put it, probably place it out on the porch somewhere. In today's show, we're gonna visit an outstanding nursery where you're gonna see some really interesting new plants. You'll find them both beautiful and drought tolerant. They're in a nursery in California. Now one chore I know all of us put off is weeding. I look for every way I can to choke weeds out of the garden from raised beds to mulch. I've even started using this filter fabric that helps keep weeds down. And in today's show, we'll learn about a way to create a barrier around your small trees. Now during this show, we'll also visit an English inspired garden and get an Italian inspired dish. We'll also head to a trade show that's full of green ideas for the home including one that I'm going to try at the Garden Home Retreat that says it will keep mold from growing behind my walls. Now that's important for a healthy home. Now, if you're interested in interesting plants, beautiful gardens, and practical tips, you're at the right place. We've got a lot coming up. For plant nerds like me, visiting a really great garden center or a nursery is an exciting treat because you get to talk with plantsmen about trends, new introductions, and get up close and personal with the blooms and foliage that you no doubt want to bring back to your own garden. I've had the opportunity to visit garden centers like this, from New England to Texas and even California. That's where we find ourselves today, at Euro-American Propagators of the Proven Winter family of plants near San Diego. Bertie Lennard Fountain showed us around and told us about some of the drought-tolerant varieties that are turning heads. You know, Bertie, there's something about color that just captures the imagination, and you guys have got a fabulous display right here. Well, what we're doing here is we're trying to get some drought tolerant, you know, low water usage plants. Which is so important these days, Especially, I mean, in yeah. many parts of the country. With our low rainfall, we have to take advantage of plants that are geared for that, but we also want to have a lot of blooms and a lot of color throughout the year. We've got the Kufia Totally Tempted, which is a sweet plant, and it does really well in a low water usage. The hummingbirds love that one. We've also got Diamond Frost, which is just a beauty. It looks so delicate, mm -hmm. but it is tough as nails. That's why it's going really well with a flambe yellow. Yeah, that plant looks like it's really drought resistant. Yeah. The gray foliage, the yellow blooms. Now in the back, we've got the Angelonia, that angel face blue. You know, Bertie, I think the common name for the Angelonia is a summer snapdragon because it blooms through the summer. That's a great name for that. Is that pineapple sage? It is, and that one's called uh, Golden Delicious, and it has the cutest little red blooms that shoot up. And the hummingbirds will do backflips uh, over those red flowers. They will. They yeah. love it. Now, Bertie, is that a canna back there at the very back? Oh, it is. It's called Intrigue, which really indicates the beauty of those leaves with that, that bronzy foliage, yeah. that purple, and then the green that's mm. in there, that chartreuse. Beautiful. It has gorgeous little orchid-shaped blooms that are, just has an orange color to it. And it looks really stunning with that gara cast against uh, it. And that gar is a dynamo. The osteos that you have here they are South are. African natives, and of course drought is an issue there. And these are beautiful because these are so gorgeous. They'll bloom all summer. They don't have any deadheading that's needed, and they just do great in a mass. If you look at the lemon over on the bank, it's just stunning. Well, clearly, even though you have to be conscious of water, you don't have to give up on good color throughout the summer. Exactly. Thanks so much, Bertie. Oh, thank you for being here. Up next, if you're tired of weeding around trees and worrying about lime trimmer damage, then we've got a handy solution. Plus a little later, an Italian-inspired recipe from a quaint neighborhood restaurant. Just take a look at the beautiful blooms of this begonia. It's a knockout, isn't it? Now I'm spraying it, even though I just brought it in from the nursery, because I don't like bringing little hitchhikers into my garden space. 
This is an annual begonia which will flourish throughout the entire spring, summer, and early fall. But when I bring things in, I want to make sure that I'm not going to have any problems with them. Now, these are some old-fashioned plants, just like the begonias, that I love to grow every year. Hollyhocks I've grown from seed. This is the black one. Actually, Thomas Jefferson grew this back in the early 19th century at Monticello. And then over here, I've got some gorgeous foxglove. Started these from seed as well. Now, what you have to look out for with plants like this is spider mite. If you begin to see the leaves becoming stippled at all, where it's losing its color, they're yellowing, and you see these little marks on it, you'll want to make sure that you spray the underside of the leaves like this. And really soak them thoroughly. Even saturate the soil. This is a good precautionary measure, and I do it throughout my garden, including my orchard. There I have some gorgeous apple trees, all old-fashioned varieties, and they're young just now, and I want them to grow into beautiful trees over time, so I'm doing some things there that help cut down the weeds, as well as keep me from using a line trimmer too close to the trunks, which could eventually kill them. You see, as weeds grow up around the trees, Lawn mowers and line trimmers and other mechanical devices can often nick the bark, which opens the door to disease and insects to enter the tree. So what can we do to give our trees a helping hand? A friend of mine, Jim Davis, visited the Garden Home Retreat and brought out a DuPont weed barrier product that fits the bill. Jim, I am so excited about getting this orchard planted with all these heritage apples. But one of the problems that we've had out here in planting the grid of crab apples as pollinators is that we had to stake and guide the trees. And, you know, through the whole last summer, we were mowing around every one of those little wires. So I'm really excited about trying this underground system. Yeah, Alan, I think we have a product here that's in development and we think is exciting. And uh, we do call it the underground tree anchoring system. This is a, a prototype sample of that, and you know, it's, it's pretty simple. It's a piece of fabric, heavy duty fabric, that's cut out in such a way that you're gonna take it and put so it the, around. So the tree trunk is my hand, and yep. you just pull it around like that. That's yeah. right, that's right. And you just plant just as you would normally. Just as you would normally. Place this on top of the root ball, root ball in the hole, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a stake, and you're gonna drive it down in the bottom of the hole off of one of the corners of this piece of fabric, and then just simply take a tie wrap and you're going to run that tie oh, wrap through the loop. Exactly. Just loop it through there and then run it through the hole in the stake. Exactly. So you're going to run that down to the stake, connect the two, but you don't pull them tight because you want to get this centered on top of the root ball. But I once see. you have that centered, then you just work your way to the oh, four different the four corners. corners. Okay. Snug it up. The pressure down on the root ball holds and anchors the tree in place. You bury it with the soil and everything is below ground. The beauty of this is it eliminates all that above ground structure. Well, this is interesting because I, I've read some studies lately where uh, the scientists are sort of going back and saying, you know, we're not so sure that it is a great idea to guy a tree the way we used to, where it just couldn't move at all. So having a little bit of movement there, the tree has an opportunity to, to be actually more vigorous and, and better stabilized. That, that, that's absolutely right. So multiple benefits from a below ground tree anchoring system. And, and we're pretty excited about what the potential is and what this represents. Well, I am too. I, I can't wait to, to get it in place out here. Excellent. Up next, I'll tell you more about the house I'm building and take you to the International Builder Show in Orlando for a look at a product I'm using to keep my house safe from mold. Okay, now who says you can't grow roses in the shade? Okay, maybe these aren't roses. They're impatience, but just look at the bloom. They look like little tiny rosebuds. These impatience have made my top 10 list of plants for the shade. These miniature rose-like blooms are an exceptional addition to areas of low light and bring sizzling color to the shade garden. I've used Rockapulco in both containers and flower beds with great success. Gardens, by their very nature, can be green. Take, for instance, this estate in Georgia where I first tried out Daffodil Hill, which I replicated on my farm. This charming garden surrounds a Georgian-style home in the heart of a southern city. Or how about this country estate with its courtyard garden and many garden rooms? 
And I can't forget the healing garden at the hospital that has been a place of restoration for staff, visitors, and patients. But perhaps the garden I'm most drawn to is the Garden Home Retreat, where I'm able to experiment with all types of green methodologies as well as plants before I take them to my design clients, and where I'm able to put to work some of the most useful ideas of the past and the present. Now, of course, the gardens at the Garden Home Retreat are green, but the house is eco-friendly as well. You see, we try to use as many methodologies and approaches as well as products to make the home as energy efficient as possible. Now, many of these systems are hidden, such as the insulated concrete forms that make up the foundation, and the soy foam insulation, as well as the radiant heat system. You see, in houses like this, you can create a really tight barrier, and if you add a quality heating and air unit, you can keep the air clean, but even with this, you can fall victim to mold that hides behind the walls when moisture builds up. That's why I think I was so drawn to this display at the International Builder Show in Orlando, Florida. Alan, as an example, if you think about this, regular paper face wall, wall board could never withstand the kind of rigor we have here, which is actual water being poured over the face of our Dens Armor Plus mold resistant wall board. And the reason we can do that is because of the glass mat facings that have tremendous moisture resistant and are truly unaffected by moisture. Chris, when you think about the amount of surface area in a, in a home, the, the amount of wall board is huge. 70 to 80 percent of the surface areas in, are in the home are wallboard. And that's why Dens Armor Plus is such an incredibly revolutionary and innovative product in meeting that indoor air quality and mold protection solution. The quality of product that goes into a home is really important because it's, it's what's behind those walls, what's, what's making up the structure of the home that is so important that you don't see. And you really don't know what's behind those walls. With the wall cavity of air gathering in the wall and not having anywhere to go when moisture gets in there, you can have horrible mold problems with a wall that you look at and don't on the outside and don't see anything. So it's just as you say, it's what be, what's behind the walls that counts. You know, one of the advantages of living out here in the country is that I've got lots of space. That's what the garden home retreat affords me. However, you don't run into your neighbors very often. Whereas in town, I have an opportunity to talk to my neighbors over the picket fence. We trade ideas and our enthusiasm for historic architecture. As a matter of fact, my neighbors, Ann and John Gerard, hosted a group of international master gardeners through their property in 2007, and they were kind enough to invite us into their garden home to see how it transformed from drab winter to brilliant summer. The concept of the building, you, you can, if you see it in plan, is, is that it, uh, it's, it's a garden. You know, the garden is part of the house, the house is part of the garden, and uh, so they were conceived together. And I think that's what makes it so successful. And one of the things that we were struck with when we first saw the house was this potential for this great garden. When we've added plants, although we do use new cultivars, we really have tried to focus on plantings that were of the period and at the same time plantings that, that have that English uh, type theme. I, th I think the English Revival style is of course the house, it's in the manor style. The garden is just an extension of the, of the entry hall. If you open the door and walk, walk in the front door and the back door is open, you get this beautiful view down the center of the garden. And that, that attracted us. Well, but we've added um, a lot of flowers like the hollyhocks, the foxgloves, the uh, yara. Uh, we now have the confederate rose. And these are all very, very old plants, the echinacea, the strawberry begonias. But you know, we have the irises and the glads and the roses that are all uh, a plants that have been used in our area for many, many years. I have some tuber roses, for instance. We have camellias, we have um, gardenias that actually those three plants were all here originally. We have English ivy that I say it blooms because uh, it has a very light bloom on it and um, it's, it has to be very old for that to happen. And we're one of the few people in Arkansas that fertilize our ivy because it just grows every place and we love it, as you've seen in some of our ivy trees. We really do garden together. I often tease he's a much better gardener than I am because he's been doing it longer, but we really do share the garden. From inspired gardens to an Italian-inspired meal, we're heading up to a popular neighborhood restaurant for tips on making this tasty dish 
up next. Cafe Prego has become a destination that symbolizes upscale but casual dining. Louis has become a friendly face that greets patrons when they walk through the door. He shared a family recipe for rosemary chicken during a recent visit to Prego. Today we're going to prepare a lemon rosemary chicken. It's a dish right off our menu that can be easily prepared at your house. The ingredients you're going to need is uh, about a cup of white wine, a cup of lemon juice, a cup of heavy whipping cream, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, some butter, some fresh rosemary right out of your garden, and some shallots to give it a little bit of flavor. You're going to want to heat your pan up first, get it nice and warm. Just about half a shallot is necessary. Then you're going to want to go ahead and add your white wine, lemon juice. Then you're going to want to add your whipping cream. At that point, just a pinch of salt, a pinch of pepper, and you're going to want to let that reduce to a boiling point. Once it's gotten down to a boiling point, then you add your butter. You add about um, a half a stick of butter and add that to thicken up the sauce. Once you've got the sauce thickened, you can add it to either chicken, veal, or salmon. It'll go along excellent with any of those choices. Today we're going to use chicken. Slice your chicken, a little side of uh, pasta, and then on the finishing touch from the garden, a fresh sprigs of rosemary. Add the sauce to it, and there you go. You have fresh lemon rosemary chicken. Well, as we've seen, if you take a few preventive measures in the garden, you can save yourself a lot of work and a lot of headaches, which takes us back to that old adage, a stitch in time saves nine. Well, this is all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. If you want that recipe for chicken, which is delicious, check out my website, pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. This garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh No, I can't help but smile.